Hello everyone, welcome to this little essay writing masterclass today. Uh, my name is Bella and we're going to jump right in in a second. Um, I was just getting a sense, I asked a question that you should be able to see below on the poll, uh, New South Wales, Victoria, Queensland. For the first time today I have majority Victorians in my audience so I sincerely apologise if you see a phrase in one of the essays we look at today that is totally unfamiliar for you. I'm from New South Wales, so I'm using my essays that are obviously New South Wales specific, but the skills are obviously applicable. I just want to make everyone aware of that. Um, I'm also just to get a sense, uh, yeah, are you in? What year are you guys in? Um, year 12, year, I mean, I, 11, or another, year 9 teacher, etc. Um, I had a bunch of people answer in one of those polls this morning, other, which scared me a bit because, um, uh, scared me a bit because I was like, oh my god, are the teachers watching me? Um, but hopefully now we can see a, you can see the stream and it's all good. So, as I mentioned, my name's Bella. I know this is the third essay for the day, uh, the third, third lecture for the day for some of you, obviously. So I don't want to go into too much the promo, given this is a one hour lecture. Um, but the gist is that this is how to write the perfect essay, a little promotional lecture here. So it's an hour, it's short and sweet, and we'll basically be going over what are the key analytical needs when you're constructing your essay. So going over thesis writing as well as others. So to introduce myself, as I said, I'm Bella. I graduated in 2019, three years ago, and I'm currently studying politics, or more correctly, PPE, politics, philosophy, and economics, and law at UNSW in Sydney. Um, I'm absolutely loving it there. So if anyone else is considering that or has any questions about law or anything, please feel free to ask. I'm happy to um, have a chat about that as well. But today, this is what we're looking at. Uh, block one, we're more going to focus on writing the perfect introduction, which basically consists of being able to answer a question effectively and constructing a thesis. Uh, the questions I've included uh, as my breakdown, just because they're nice and formatted, are English questions, specifically I think English extension questions, uh, or an English and English extension question. However, the methodology is applicable um, The me sorry, if you see me looking down and checking, I have the poll and the Q&A just on my phone. Um, the methodology is applicable regardless of the subject. So this is an essay writing, uh, the way I've structured it, the way I've broken down the methods for constructing a good intro, uh, a thesis, even body paragraphs and conclusion uh, is applicable. And the examples I'm using are from histories, English and religion. Uh, that will also mean it is largely going to be applicable to subjects uh, that are similar to religion, like legal studies, economics, uh, business studies, maybe not so much economics, I don't know how that works. There are some essays, but some maths, I think. Um, in terms of applicability to Victoria and Queensland, I'm sorry, I don't know what your equivalent subjects are, but I'm hoping, given that this is an analytical essay, I'm not getting into things like how to incorporate context and stuff like that, like you would in English. It should generally be about here is how you construct a really good argument and express that argument. In block two, we're going to be digging down a little bit more into how to structure your body paragraphs. And again, as I say, this is going to be applicable to multiple subjects and how to finish your essay with a really great conclusion. So I want to just start with why we care about, say, introductions uh, and theses and stuff like that. Because you'll notice that I've split this essay a lecture up into two parts, even though it's an hour. Um, and the first part is all about like the first 150 words. And then the rest of it is about the other 700, you know, 800 of words. Why does an introduction matter so much? Uh, and the reality is, is I've labeled here that teachers can be petty, but realistically teachers, when they're marking your essays in the HC, the QCA, the VCE, do not have the same time that your classroom teachers have. Uh, they cannot pour over every single essay. Uh, they have to give you a fair mark, understand it, they're trained, they're experts, and get into your essay. An introduction is therefore going to be the clearest indicator to your marker of what band you'll get, 
and what your place in that band is. I remember my teacher, my extension history teacher, doing an exercise with us in the class to demonstrate this. And he pulled up a bunch of past trial papers. It was in preparation for our trials for extension history. And he pulled up a bunch of papers from last year. Um, and he pulled it up. He just wanted us to read the intro and guess the mark. And he, it was a year ago, he didn't remember the essays, but he'd read through it and go, yeah, so ancient history extension is marked out of 25 for the essay. And he'd go, yeah, I think this is a 21. And he'd scroll down to where the mark was, and it was a 21. And I think he got every single one except for one accurate, just based on that introduction. Now, he obviously, during trial, spent hours and hours on these papers, so it wasn't just basing off the introduction. But regardless, the introduction is a very clear indicator of what your end mark might be. The reason for this is it's going to outline your argument, uh, which is going to make up the rest of your essay, right? It's going to give your marker an insight into the sophistication and clarity of your ideas and also your structure, your phrasing, all that kind of stuff. If you write an introduction that's a bit confused, it loops around on itself, a marker's probably going to go, oh, they're not very confident. I don't am not filled with pleasure upon reading this essay. So from the first few moments of your essay, you have to answer that question, but make an impact in the mind of your marker. And how you can do that is by ensuring that your thesis and your answer to the question is spot on. So I'm going to give you a really silly um, way to... Uh... Okay, cool. Um, I'm going to give you a really silly way to break down a question. It's a bit silly because it's an acronym. Stop. Um, and acronyms can often be a bit silly. So this is how anytime you see an essay question, you're going to begin deconstructing it. Most people, when they see an essay question, don't immediately have an answer in their head. How you get to that point where you go, yeah, I know what I'm saying, is by methodically breaking down the question to the point where it just becomes second nature to break down that question. So let's jump straight in. The acronym I would use is Kitty. As I said, it's a little bit silly, it's a little bit cute. I'm not a cat person, I'm a dog person. My dog is chilling in the doorway right there. Um, but it is really straightforward. So when you're answering the question or breaking down the question, you go through this method. What are the key words in the question? What is your interpretation of those key words? What topics are you going to discuss that relate to those key words and your interpretation? What content are you going to bring in to support those topics? And then link it back to the elective. Now, elective is a bit of an odd word here because it's from an extension English context. It effectively, in your mind, replace it with module, unit, whatever you want to do, option, etc. Uh, all the others just sound a bit... I mean, I guess kitto is a bit fun um, for option, but for now, kitty will do elective, right? This is your kind of goal. And I made it nice and rainbow because we're going to break it, break it down in that manner. Um, but this is the methodology, uh, you, the method you want to use the first time you see a question. So let's start. For English and indeed for most subjects, your keywords are going to look something like this. Your task word, hang on, let me get it. Your task word is your link to your syllabus. I did this in my last lecture and it, apparently I'm a sucker for punishment because I cannot write with a mouse, but you know, we're going to try our best. That Y looks so nice and then the rest of the word is a mess. The task word, no, that's not what the task word is. That's what the prescribed focus is. That's the rubric link. I'm sorry, everyone. I'm having a moment. The task word, stop. Erase all ink. There we go. The task word is like, to what extent? It is your action word. Evaluate. Analyze. Etc. Um, that's your task word. It's still essential to know because how you respond is going to be dependent on the task word. To what extent? You're going to have to respond to a great, to a limited extent. Analyze, evaluate at different levels of intensity. Even for a short answer, right, you're going to take into account, is it a describe, is it a discuss, what is it? Task word, pretty important, probably the least important of these four, though. Your rubric link 
is your syllabus. Uh, rubric is obviously the English word in terms of the subject of English. Quite often, syllabus link, curriculum link, however you want to say it. So, bus. Hopefully you guys can have a nice chuckle at me trying to write with a mouse. That's your syllabus. That is where you're going. Basically, when you look at the question, okay, what is this question actually asking me? Like, what have I learned to be able to answer this question? Prescribed focus is the funky thing. It's something that's not in the rubric. It's the phrase when they chuck in that it adds to it and you're like, I didn't technically study that. That's the thing that it's going to trick you, basically. It hones your attention in to a specific element of the syllabus that you may not have explicitly learned. You still will have learned it because it's in the syllabus somewhere, but it's an exact, it's an elaboration, an exploration, an extrapolation, however you want to say it. Audience impact is the funky one. This will depend on the subject and also on the um, on the subject and also on the length of the response. So in an eight marker, you may not discuss audience impact. This is, as I said, the English words for it, but audience impact refers to basically why. What is this question saying is the point. For studies of religion, it would be something like helping adherence to do something, right? It's something about why do people still follow that religion. For history, uh, it's about better understanding. Uh, again, there's no audience in this case, but it is why do we learn this? For English, it is what the impact on the audience is. Uh, for legal studies, it might be what the effect of those laws are. You get the point. So let's start with keywords. And I'm giving you this question. It's not an easy question, to be clear. Um, it's not an easy question, to be clear, so don't stress. It's an extension English question. But the point is, this is how we're going to draw out what these keywords are. So remember, it was our task word, to what extent, our rubric focus, which is, doesn't really say, right? It's not super clear, so we're going to move on. It's more probably emotions. Um, a prescribed focus. Again, we're using fear of language, so it's a bit hard, but it's probably going to be thread our lives together, right? Um, and then we go to the audience, which is, you know, explore. That's audience understanding. In English, um, if you ever hear, you know, what do they explore in different ways? To what extent do the texts, you know, highlight something? Your audience impact is the audience understanding something. Now, you'll notice here that I kind of breeze through that. And I was just like, okay, well, this is clearly like emotions, thread, that, that. There's two reasons for that. One, I've looked at these slides a bunch of times. Two, I feel very comfortable being able to pull out these keywords. You may not. In which case, especially when you see something like this, where you have no clue what the rubric is, that's okay. You probably, in looking at this question and having a critical think, went, went well, emotion seems pretty important. That thread bit and maybe the seamstress bit seem fairly important. Uh, this is all pretty straightforward, but we've got to what extent. So I should probably take note of that. And you'd be exactly right. That is also the way you can break through. You don't have to follow, like, here is this, here is this, here is this. But it is a really good way to look at it. It just allows you to make sure every single bit of the question is being addressed within your thesis, right? If you, um, if you don't pay attention to it, you're probably going to miss something in your essay. So if I just saw this and went emotions and then went, okay, it's about emotions. Like I, the text is exploring emotions, hey? I probably would miss the fact that obviously thread is key here. Now, what does that actually mean? Oh, it's figurative and flowery. It's about the importance and blah, blah, blah. But that's not the point. The point is you can sometimes miss something and then not realize the rest of the question. I really, um... Uh, a really good example of this is an ancient history example, which seems a bit silly, but I'll read it anyway. And for those of you that understand ancient history, it'll be helpful. If you don't, don't worry. Um, it's a question that goes something like this. Des 
discuss the different tactics of the archaeologists at Pompeii and Herculaneum in the 19th century. Now, it would be tempting, I'll discuss the key contributions of archaeologists. Oh, hell yeah, easy. Uh, you got Maori, you got Fiorelli, you got someone, you got Oza, whatever. The key part of that question, that was the archaeologists, the impacts, that's the rubric, right? That's the syllabus. The, in the 19th century is the prescribed bit. You could ignore that and write a response and it still makes sense, but you're not going to do well because you've missed out on a key aspect of the question. So even before you start thinking about writing an essay, you need to make sure you know what the question is asking and how to interpret that. And that brings us on to the next question. As I said, well, look, I got thread, emotions, to what extent, there we go. We could have had explore as well, um, but different ways, right? So then we move on to interpretation, which is yellow, as you can see, or an orange yellow. This is just a bit of a breakdown. This, your, uh, your interpretation may not look like this, and that's totally okay, because it's about how you interpret the, what the question is actually saying. So you might see emotions. So in this case, we have empathy, isolation, passion. Uh, that's gonna be derived by what texts I'm talking about, in this case, because it's an English essay. Um, but it could be something else. If my emo uh, emotions in my text are about uh, family, or I'm trying to think of the other ones um, that I studied, um, connection, those types of things, I might bring that up instead. As we can see, judgment to what extent. Uh, as uh, I've elaborated here, I've also kind of said, okay, um, a lack of emotion can also be important, right? It doesn't have to be emotion. Now that's a bit of it's a similar thing like you're still answering the question you're putting a bit of a spin on it though and then finally you've got different we know what different means that's okay in this case i've elaborated a bit more by saying frankenstein heaney and beckett and their authors um well frankenstein is not an author obviously that is the book um okay then we might move on so we've done k and i i is really just thinking further about k really um as you kind of go through the process of K, you will have um, already kind of interpreted it because you might be thinking about to what extent already, as we said, explore, which is kind of that audience impact. And I saw someone ask, what does audience impact mean again? Think of it as being like, what are you meant to get out of whatever task you're doing? Uh, whether it's reading the laws and analyzing them, what do you get out of that? An understanding of how they work, an understanding of how they might change. When reading a text, what does an audience get out of that? An understanding of the complexities of emotion, the fragility of humanity, something like that. Uh, when analyzing religion, your audience impact might be something like about uh, how we, we can understand how religious adherents gain meaning from said religion. So it's about you as an objective observer, what do you get when you put the facts together? So you can almost think of it as in a bit of an order. Task word is kind of number one because it doesn't matter heaps. It does matter, but it isn't going to necessarily make or break your question. Your next one is going to be the rubric. So as we said, that's the syllabus uh, because you need to know what you're answering, right? Your prescribed focus is number three because it gives further detail to number two and gives you a bit more context. It's almost like it's the specific thing you're going to discuss. And then audience impact is number four. What do we get out of studying this? Why do we, why are we writing this essay? What is it that the religion wants people to get out of it? The historians want people to get out of it? Why is it worthwhile studying this? It's kind of you saying to, uh, Nessa, or I don't know who, what the Victorian equivalent's called, um, or Queensland for that matter, hey, I actually get the point of this. I understand that adherents follow Christianity to get meaning. I understand that we're studying this aspect in history to better understand how uh, politics has intermingled with uh, the rise of the USSR. I'm writing this to better understand why laws about young offenders are maybe not uh, doing what they should be doing, basically. So 
So K and I are nice and straightforward. Then we move on to T and T, topic and content. The topic is straight up just, uh, what am I writing on? Um, what am I writing on? What are my paragraphs, basically? Um, what am I writing on? What are my paragraphs? What is the topic? So it this is again dependent on the subject. So I've also said content is like body paragraphs or arguments, context or arguments. Yeah. Um, hang on. Let me just check one thing. I just want to check my color coordination is. Keep. Just checking my color coordination is correct because I don't want to say the wrong thing. So topic is kind of like you briefly introduce your body paragraphs. Um, it is about talking about these are my arguments today. It's X, Y, and Z. Um, all the focus of your essay. It's basically that contextual. Like here is what I will be discussing today. Content is about expanding on it. So without um, the Victorian equivalent is called DOSA. Thank you very much. Department of Student something or other. Thank you. I appreciate that. That's a really weird name. Um, unless you're trying to trick me into saying something so you can go like buffer or something. I hope not. I hope you're being nice. Um, effectively, this is the middle part of your introduction, but it, this will be the middle part of your introduction, but it's thinking about how you'll be responding to the question. Again, you're not necessarily writing this down yet. This will be done automatically. I know it seems a bit weird to be going through it in such detail. But effectively, this is what you're thinking in your head. Okay, I've interpreted the question. I know I'm talking about emotions. I'm going to pick this quote and this quote. And then we move into elective, uh, which is effectively your summary sentence linking it back to the unit. Now, that is Kitty, right? That is how you break down a question. Not necessarily write your intro. That is understanding a question. And we've taken about 20 minutes-ish to go through that. That's totally fine. Um, as you're learning how to kind of respond to essays, it might take you a bit of time to figure out what the question is asking you. As you get more confident, especially if you're tuning into this lecture and you're in year 11, that will become significantly more automatic. As you can see, I was getting to this and going like, wait, which one's what? Because it's just something mentally that I skip now. I don't need to do that really detailed. When you're first doing an English essay, for a content, doing a history essay, you might spend a bit longer going, okay, this is what I'd probably bring up. It's just gonna be less formal as you get more confident. So, after going through our kitty steps, you will should, hopefully, understand your question and know what your argument is going to be. That is going to turn into a thesis. That is also going to begin your introduction. All theses have three things. A link to the question, a link to the subject slash rubric slash syllabus, and then your own ad, which is your argument. This link to question and rubric will be referred to as question, and your own unique spin will be referred to as expand in the next few slides, and you'll see why in a second. That is because this is the structure of our introduction. Uh, it's a bit silly in terms of again like it's less silly it's more silly than kitty uh because it's not an acronym i just kept using it and then i was like well it's kind of a word it's like quetel that's not a thing and then i was like huh it's like a petal with the q it's not a thing but if it helps one of you remember the order of an introduction i see that as an absolute win um <laughs> so this is the order of an introduction it almost as you can see by the colors mirrors kitty so keywords to an extent is your question. Expand is almost like your interpretation, kind of. Your topic, you can see, same thing. Your argument is like your content and your link is your elective, right? So your topic is what you're writing about. Your argument will be your body paragraphs. You can see the link a little bit clearer now. But let's go first into what, oh, that's ugly, that text. Um, let's go into what the first two are, right? It's your thesis, question and expand. As I said, every thesis will answer the question, address the rubric, which will be in the question or the syllabus, and then th 
if you want to, and not all theses will necessarily have this. I've got to go back, please, for those two minutes ago. Um, you guys should have access, FYI, sorry. Uh, under this, I should have said that. I was too eager to get in. Under this video, there should be slides for you to download. Um, after this video is finished, you'll be able to re-watch re it as well if I've gone too fast. Um, so don't stress too much about that. Anyway, this is your thesis. As I said, it should address the question and therefore address the rubric or syllabus and expand on it if you want to. The expansion is not compulsory. Many essays don't do it. In fact, to get a 20 out of 20, you don't need to necessarily expand. And I'll show you an example of that in a second. This is how an introduction starts. This is a very, very rough structure. Um, don't worry if it seems a bit odd. Uh, it sounds pretty clunky because it's a lot of fill in the blanks. But ultimately, your introduction, this is for English, might sound something like this. And this would be your thesis. Texts that explore the question allow the audience to reflect on and better understand the question. Indeed, through this examination, a composer may challenge a value in the question, prompting the audience to respond. That's a really, really basic bare bones English thesis. And you can see within this first one, we're linking to the question all the time. You can see that I've said link to question, link to question, link to question. It may, your thesis may not necessarily look like that. That's totally fine. This is just a really rough example. I find sometimes uh, especially at the beginning of year 12, a lot of people feel really uncomfortable writing theses. You haven't really spoken about theses and then you get into year 11 and it's like, okay, so your thesis, and it's like, hey, I don't know what that is. I don't know how to write that. And teachers are like, oh, it's just your argument. And it's like, okay, but why give it a special name? Writing a thesis can often be one of the hardest parts of an essay because you're putting it into words. So I often find that giving a structure, even if it's very, very genetic, genetic, generic rather, uh, can just be effective in terms of getting, easing you into the process. So that's for an English essay. This might be for a history essay. Uh, question had an impact on question to a great extent as it was able to question. I know that sounds stupid. So let's say uh, uh, ideology had a uh, impact on Soviet foreign policy to a great extent as it gave the nation a driving goal. However, it would be remiss to dismiss leadership of the Soviet Union and it is only through the uh, looking at the whole picture that we can better understand foreign policy in the Soviet Union, for instance. Just because the filling in the blanks there sounded a bit clunkier. Again, this second bit is not necessarily necessary. Uh, if you can get your thesis out straight away and then spend more time just expanding on it by yourself, that is also totally fine. Uh, if I wanted to fill in the blanks for this one, actually, we're going to see one in a second. I don't need to do that. Um, but this is roughly what you can do for, say, a history thesis. Again, it may not sound like that. And to be honest, um, my history thesis didn't sound like that. I was just trying to stick to the same pattern to make it easier for you guys. Uh, essay writing is all about, yes, following a formula, but expressing yourself. And I know that sounds immensely cheesy, um, but it is meant to be conveying your argument. So you can follow this structure initially, but remember it is about your own expression. You get marked on personal voice. Now, what does personal voice mean uh, in subjects in humanities in English? Well, it tends to be about an opinion you're expressing well. When I say your opinion, obviously it doesn't mean you say, I believe X, Y, and Z. We park that at the door. It is all about you having an argument that you're able to back up with evidence. Doesn't necessarily have to be the most unique argument in the world, uh, but it, it works basically. So let's go back to a natural introduction. Oh, I didn't change the font there. That's a bit sad. Let's go back to this as an introduction. Now you can see immediately there is no yellow in this introduction. Um, if you just tuned in to my crucible lecture an hour and a bit ago, you will have already seen this introduction. Um, so apologies for that, but hopefully this looks a bit nicer. Now it's colorful and not a black wall of text. 
So the question in this case, and let's break it down together, and when I say together, I mean I will talk and you guys can just listen, um, is this. The purpose of a storyteller is not to tell you how to think, but to give you questions to think upon. Evaluate this statement in relation to your prescribed text. So let's start with number one. Uh, we're going to through Kitty again, right? So we're starting with our key words. Let's start with one, which is the task word, evaluate. Then we go to the rubric. In this case, it's storytelling. Uh, we talk about the purpose of storytelling or the power of storytelling in this unit in English in New South Wales in year 12. Um, so it's storytelling. Could also be give you questions to think upon, but that may, at the very least, if that's not the rubric and it's kind of marginal, um, that is definitely our prescribed focus. Storytelling as a way of giving you questions. And then we go to the audience. What are we meant to be getting out of this essay? Well, it's kind of a bit overlappy, but it is give you questions to think upon as an audience member. Um, so it's a bit overlappy. That looks a bit messy, but that's okay. I then go to I, interpret. Uh, I've already made that link about purpose of storytelling, power of storytelling. So I can say, well, the power of storytelling is to be critical. Uh, to challenge you, it's about exploration, right? Um, so, you know, not tell you how to think, give you questions, exploration, uh, queries, you know, those types of things. Um, then we go topic and content. I'm thinking, okay, the topics I'm probably going to talk about here is maybe intolerance, uh, just so I'm not reading out the exact same thing. I'm at agency about the importance of not depriving people of agency and maybe the uh, nefarious impacts of power. Um, and they're my eye. Um, and then I might move on to, I've got content, that's fine, that's about the quotes, and then I link and I just link it back, right? That's my E. So I, we've gone through Kitty. Then we can now move on to writing our actual introduction. So question and expand. Our qu of our quetel is our thesis. I don't have an E here, so I've really just answered the question in one sentence. And I've said text allow for the challenging of traditional ideas. So I've used a different word there. I haven't said questions to think upon because I'm going to use question in a second. I'm going to use question in the rest of my introduction. So challenging kind of links here. And then I've got traditional ideas, a storyteller, we can see, inviting the audience to question and critically reflect upon their own world. So, I reckon I've answered the question there. It's very philosophical, as you'll notice in this one, these ones, it's text that or question had an impact on blah. Um, that's just the way how I wrote my essays. You could start with the crucible allows for a challenging of traditional ideas. This is about the crucible. Um, instead of saying text allow, it really depends on what you feel comfortable with. That is a much of a muchness. You're not gonna like fail an essay because you've done something like that differently. You can be successful in either way. I like the sophistication of this, but I also just got used to writing essays and introductions and theses this way. Now we move on to topic. We've skipped expand. I didn't really need it here. We will get to other ones that have a bit of an expand. Um, we move into our topic. So this is basically outlining your essay, providing a bit of context, uh, going into what you're actually going to be talking about. Arthur Miller's The Crucible provides exactly this. I don't. I hate that phrasing. I leave it because I like this intro and it's a good one, but every time I read it, I'm like, Ew. Um, it obviously didn't go badly for me, but I just am like, every time, it's so not like me to say, does this, it's just, ugh. Anyway, uh, with Miller's allegorical dramatic exploration of the witch trials being used to comment on his Cold War American context, prompting the audience to challenge, blah, 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 blah. We're not gonna get into the nitty gritty of that. This is an in the English lecture. Um, and if you did my crucible lecture a while ago, you've already heard me deconstruct this, so I don't need to do it again. But you can see that I'm bringing up uh, what 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 am I studying? It's the crucible. Uh, what's the point of studying it? That type of thing. Then I move on to Miller represents the manipulation of authority. Body paragraph one, the detrimental impacts of societal intolerance. Paragraph two, and the perverse nature of hysteria. Paragraph three. Questioning their continuing relevance. Argument, in this case, similar con similar to content. It's just, I'm talking about X, Y, and Z. And in case this way of going through it, like speeding through it and going bang, 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 is a bit unfamiliar to you, you can absolutely write 
essays and introductions like this. So if you're studying something in modern history, you might say the success of the Vietnamese army came down to uh, good local support, uh, psychological tactics and the failure of the American offensive. I don't have to go. Uh, the, the home support the, uh, the Viet Cong had helped bolster their enthusiasm immensely. Indeed, the poor defensive tactics outlined by them, I can just slide through them. Of course, you can go about the other way, but provided you're giving enough context in this green part, you don't have to keep expanding on those arguments, given that you're going to expand on them straight away in your body paragraphs anyway. Okay, let's take a look at this introduction. We'll go through it again. This isn't a good introduction, as you can see. It's how not to write an introduction. Um, analyze the way form has been manipulated to represent human motivations and desires. Okay, so I can't remember if human motivations and desires is a rubric. I think so. Um, so we have analyze is our first task word. Uh, form is our prescribed. This is English. And then we go represent motivations and desires. I'm pretty sure is the prescribed or it's flipped, but I think it's this way. Um, and then we go, what's the audience in here? What are we meant to be getting out of? It's that representation aspect. So let's have a read of this intro. The composer has the ultimate say and the creation and manipulation of the text. Context, therefore, affects values. Shakespeare's Richard III examines the values of key ideas in light of both contextual and individual understandings. Whilst Pacino examines the same values in Looking for Richard, a comparative study highlights how different contexts shape postmodern concerns of his film. Therefore, both texts are important depictions of power. We kind of have this colour. Uh, we have no body paragraphs. There's no blue here because I have no clue what the argument is, right? Um, we have kind of a bit of context we've been given about the text, but like that's being generous. It's really not that green. And this is our red. It's meant to be answering the question. But as we said, we've got form, representation, motivations and desires. Um, I mean, we kind of have composer has the ultimate say, which can maybe be manipulated. But let's be real creation and manipulation there you go so we kind of have this there's no mention i mean context could be an expansion if we wanted to that could be an orange but there's nothing in this intro about that and there's no body paragraph so on the whole it's a bit of an oof this essay right it's not this intro doesn't tell me what you're saying it's not following the pattern alternatively we might say something like this so i have changed it's not about Richard, just because I've written something else up. This is a lot more colourful, right? We've got a nice gradient rainbow. A composer's manipulation of form, tick straight away, has the capacity for a more nuanced portrayal of human motivations, tick, be it desire for control or ideological unity in a tumultuous time. Bang. We've answered the question. Do we need this yellow bit? Probably not, but let's go through it anyway. Indeed, audiences may better understand the ability of the author themselves through mobilizing form, bang, to reflect their own perspectives and motivation for constructing the text. And you can kind of see here, texts that or composers that manipulate form in order to portray, offer a more nuanced portrayal of human motivations are able to something. Indeed, audiences can better understand. You can see I've kind of followed that pattern. Then we move into the content. Um, then we move into the content. Miller's hybrid prey, the crucible, blah, 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 blah. Uh, and then we go into, I think I've stuffed up the blue there. I think the green should carry on all the way down here, but that's okay. That was me doing this on an iPad, unfortunately. Through the utilization of theatrical form techniques and his own personal authority attrusion, Miller divulges the social consequences of desiring absolute power. Critiquing motivation between intolerance and all-consuming hysteria. They're the same body paragraphs, I know. Please give me a break. Thus, by examining Miller's own manipulation of form, our intro, uh, we can better understand the power of text to divulge innate human motivations and desires. Bang. Much nicer and colourful and is answering that question. So we see we've got the Q, we've got the E. We don't probably need the E. The E is a bit, you know, optional. 
got the T. We got the A. We got the L. Okay, another introduction. I'm just going to whiz through these because I want to get to body paragraphs right. Um, question different words. Um, modern history paragraph now. To what extent was Lenin a critical factor in the Bolshevik consolidation of power? We can see with this we're going to answer it a bit more straightforward because it's history. English likes a bit of flowery language sometimes, right? We've immediately got to what extent. That's our, you know, one of our Ks. Uh, another one of our Ks is, you know, if critical factor, Bolshevik consolidation of power is our unit. That's our, um, our rubric there. So that's our rubric. Um, this Lenin critical factor is also in the rubric, but this is probably our prescribed, you know? Um, the audience, not really there. doesn't matter as much, right? Lenin was a highly critical factor, the Bolshevik consolidation of power. Highly critical, Bolshevik consolidation of power. Answered the question pretty immediately. It's a bit boring to stop there, though, so we've expanded slightly more. We've explained. We've expanded. Leadership and ideology underpinned all action and activity undertaken by the Bolshevik Party up till 1924. We've given some context. We've given some background info. We have... Um, we have expanded instead of just leaving it there. Then we're going to move into our topic. So we're explaining it a bit more. So your detail, you get almost more detailed as you go on, and then your link takes it back up. I'm so sorry for my ugly arrows. Lenin exerted the highest degree of involvement and or oversight in all diplomatic, political and militaristic matters. This is evident through the significant contributions Lenin made to the consolidation efforts in regards to his early social and political forms, the Treaty of brest the Civil War and War Communism, and the New Economic Policy. They are my three body paragraphs. Through these factors, Lenin clearly demonstrated his indispensability, using a different word, status as a highly critical factor. Going back and answering the question at all times. Again, we're very clearly almost telling a story. We're not telling a story though, because like in essays we're analytical, right? We're not storytelling. However, your responses should flow as if you're telling a story. It should be nice and flowing. It doesn't have to be abrupt and harsh and overly, you know, I guess devoid of any personality. It's about making sure it fits together. That fitting together is just done analytically. I'm going to skip through this next introduction, but you can see it, you can have a read of it. Um, have a go at trying to pick out the keywords yourself and link through. As you can see with this one, the green kind of goes around, hey? Uh, that's because this is poetry, it's a little bit harder. And another history one, another Bolshevik consolidation of power that wasn't intentional. But you can see this is a nice, very short one. You can see the yellow runs into the green and the blue kind of runs into the purple. There's nothing wrong with that. But all the elements are there. I'm going to come back to that. Let's move on to body paragraphs um, because that's still really important, right? So... Your aim with body paragraphs, much like how when we were writing out Quetel. Hey, Harry. Hey, Harry. Oh, my dog just visited the doorway and left me. How it was going kind of down until the link kind of brought it back up. Um... This is also doing the same thing. You want to aim your body paragraphs. It sounds bizarre, but hopefully visualizing it will help. You want to aim your body paragraphs to be like an upside down triangle. What that means is you start broad and you're getting more specific as you go on and offering more specific examples. Then again, the link will take you back up to that topic. What does that actually look like in practice though? We have our topic, we have our introduction, we have our point. However you want to describe it, a peel, a teal, or whatever. It goes for basically all humanities plus English subjects. 
What this means is you start with that. It's our broad statement. I'm talking about uh, the NEP. I'm talking about power in the crucible. I'm talking about... Um, I'm talking about... Um, I'm talking about the, uh, you know, baptism in Christianity, for instance. Just pull a different subject out of there. Then we move on to the elaboration or the explanation. What did I call it for this? Hey? Expand. It could also be expand if you would rather keep it consistent. Um, this is where you just expand, basically. You say, this topic is about this. You know, the baptism is a key sacred sacrament that is derived from blah, 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 blah. Power in the crucible is demonstrated by blah, 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 blah. Uh, the NEP was a plan implemented by Lenin after the Civil War to blah, 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 blah. Basically, context to your argument. Then you move into evidence and explanation. This is, as it suggests, your evidence. Um, it is all about saying, here is what I have to prove my point, and then I'm going to elaborate on it. I maybe should have swapped elaborate and explanation down, but that's fine. And you're going to do that as we're going to come to three or four times. You want three or four pieces of evidence and explanation in each body paragraph. And then you just link it back. Now, because I'm so nice, I've also color coded this. So we look, we got Quedal. We got Kitty. And then you can also use Peel or teal. Now, obviously, you've all used come across peel or teal before. I'm sorry, the purple doesn't stand out as well there. Or you may have come across like P, where they repeat the E's heaps, or T, or whatever. Um, and there are various others. There's pet or whatever. Not the point. The point is, is this can be used for any essay subject. What you'll notice is that the colors kind of all correspond. The question and the keywords and the topic, they're all red. They're all about getting what, what am I actually saying? What is my answer? What am I actually focusing on here? Your explanation, your interpretation, your elaboration is all about expanding, providing that context and actually knowing what you're going to write about. Then you move into your topics, which is more the evidence side. I should have flipped those colors around. The explanation, not the evidence. Um, the topic is like, what am I talking about? What's the point I'm making? Your argument. Then you have your argument, your content, which is the blue in this case, and how that kind of links. What am I bringing up in order to support my individual argument? Then your link, your element, your link, or your elective. And it all kind of links together. Now, that's all really ugly, so I'm going to clear it. But you can kind of see, right, it flows through the same pattern. So let's take a look at how we might structure a body paragraph and then I can spend about 10 minutes on questions. Um, and I saw someone asked, is there any way I can record this lecture? Um, so absolutely, this lecture is recorded. Obviously it's being live streamed. What you should be able to do is after this lecture ends, you can go back and watch the thing again or reload the page and then go back and watch the lecture again. Uh, so you don't have to say goodbye to my voice forever if you don't want to. <coughs> That's my first cough of the day. I'm normally really bad at coughing during lectures. <coughs> so let's break down what this might mean for each subject you do. Now I've picked History, English Studies of Religion and Other Humanities. Um, primarily because these first three I did. The Other Humanities I'm just kind of guessing. Um, but... It is basically demonstrating that this rough theme works for every essay subject, basically. This rough pattern, this rough method should work for you no matter what you're studying. Uh, you probably do it for like others, like a science mini essay, but I'm not giving you that advice because I didn't, I did chemistry in year 11 and then I got out of there. Um, so either way, what you're doing kind of instantly, you're introducing something. So for history, it's whatever the topic, the NEP, uh, Vietnamese uh, tactics. English, you're introducing your theme, revenge, power. Studies of religion, your study area. Um, so that might be baptism, Pope John the Paul, John the 23rd, whatever. 
Other humanities introduced topic, you kind of get the gist by now, um, but it might be young offenders protocols or uh, globalization. <laughs> As you can see, I didn't do it, but hopefully you can kind of make that link. Your second step, your orange step, I'm going to change my color, is the explanation bit. What is the NEP? What were, or why does it matter that Vietnamese combat tactics were used? English, it's about linking to context or purpose. Why has Arthur Miller decided to explore power? Why does Shakespeare need to make a point about revenge and forgiveness? So elaborating on that. Studies of religion, similar principle. Why do we care about baptism? Why do Christians do it? Why do Muslims go on Hajj? So what is the connection to the religion or the faith? Other humanities, why do we study young offenders protocols? I'm not sure, again, I'm not sure. I can't think of it off the top of my head, so I can't unfortunately give you a random uh, analysis off the top of my head. Um, then we move on to our blue and green bit. Now, this is admittedly where it gets a little bit funkier because it flips a little bit. Because obviously you're going to have within, as I've said, we've got three or four for each, right? Including for studies of religion. Obviously you can't, you're not just chucking four quotes in and going, yeah, that's good enough. What we need to do is move through and actually accurately go, this is what I'm pointing out. This is my evidence to support. It gets a bit funky because I've ordered quote, impact, source, explanation, evidence, analysis. But you can also think of it as like point or argument, quote, impact, argument, source, analysis, whatever you want to do. Um, so we have our green, which is our topic, basically. What are we bringing up? Impact, explanation, analysis. Why does this piece of evidence I'm bringing up add to my argument? Why does this quote I'm bringing up add to the purpose and the theme? Why does this source explain the importance of baptism to a religion? Then we move on to our evidence. This is straightforward. This is, you know, a statistic, a quote with a technique, uh, a Bible quote or a theologian quote, a specific uh, legal case. Um, then finally we go our link and that just links all the way back to what is our point right the quote the impact the source the evidence etc as i've said we want to be doing that three or four times per paragraph i probably should have picked a different color there but that's fine three is the minimum that's the goal ideally four best best essays will have four obviously it depends if it's a 15 mark essay you're not going to get four in every paragraph um, but if it is a regular 45 minute essay, a 20, 25 mark essay, your goal is three paragraphs of four pieces of evidence or four arguments, basically. And now you can see it nice and colorfully, properly. Um, so you can see how it works. It all kind of matches. Now, because I want to answer some questions, I'm not going to go through these paragraphs, but you can see they're very nice and colorful. As you can see, it's not necessarily that I follow the order of, this is a history one, of green, blue. Because we have kind of green, blue, green, blue, green, blue, green. So it kind of is a bit funky. And we have quite a long link. That's okay. It doesn't have to fit exactly with this structure. This structure is a guide to help you tick basically all the boxes. Same with this one. This is an English paragraph. Ignore the numbers, that's to signal something else and I didn't want to delete all the numbers. Red, yellow, if you were do in my Crucible lecture this afternoon, this was one of the paragraphs. It looks a lot nicer when it's not black and white. Um, yellow, green, blue. So again, English here, I actually said blue, green, quote impact. But here we've got green, blue, uh, green, blue, green, blue. So we flipped it a bit, that's okay. Another, no, this isn't history, this is a religion. Uh, green, blue, heaps of green, blue, little bit of green, little bit of blue. As you can see, it's not necessarily even, it's not necessarily accurate, and that's okay, provided you're mixing it up. Um, and as you can see, there's obviously a link missing here, but that's because I cut the body paragraph in half. Um, it's not perfect. The colors aren't necessarily equal, but that's not the point. The colors are a guide for you to be able to tick off all the things you need to do. Finally, we move on to our conclusion. 
I like to think of this as the mic drop moment for your essay, um, which is effectively you should be able to put your pen down at the end of your essay and be like, hell yeah, I nailed that. Um, that's effectively should be your goal. It's short, it's simple. Generally, it'll be restate your thesis and your arguments. Sometimes you can also add a little bit of flair at the end. To be honest, I've cut off the flair. This, this conclusion did have a flair, a um, bit of flair to it, and I deleted it because it just complicated my vibe. Um, but as you can see, thesis, arguments. So that's the Q. The arguments is a T there. We're still following the same color pattern just to make it easier. So, as you can see, conclusively, through his manipulation of form, Miller is able to deeply assess human motivations and desires. Miller goes further, blah, 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 blah. Centralized power, one. Social intolerance, two. So, manipulation of social power. I feel like that may not be quite correct, but that's okay. Not the point. Uh, here, we've actually flipped it for modern. Um, that the social... So we have our kind of thesis here, thus Soviet problem policy was only partially successful. Uh, the survival of the Soviet state over the spread of socialism, basically. Uh, through the militaristic, strategic, diplomatic and sociocultural factors that impacted were impacted by Soviet foreign policy, uh, as said, aims were fundamentally incompatible. So still our arguments, we've just flipped it around. Now, 